Hey Pursuit Student Fam, Pastor John. I want to invite you tonight to join us for a very special message from Pastor Jordan Green. Tonight's message is a throwback message, but I want to tell you that this message from Pastor Jordan is one of the first messages that I heard from him and it radically altered my perception and the way that I proceeded in my relationship with Jesus Christ. It was so powerful to me personally that I wanted to share it with you, our Pursuit Student family tonight. So I pray that you will just take in this message and I pray that it blesses you the same way that it blessed me. I love you and we'll see you again next week. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Galatians 5, chapter 1. Um, if you don't have your Bibles, you can uh, pick up your phone real fast, download our app. We have it on there. Um, just go to Galatians 5, 1, hang out there for a few minutes because we're going to get there. Um, but here's the thing. I want to introduce an idea. And we, we've, had a, we've had an awesome, uh, awesome opportunity to see this at work. Uh, and it's the idea of platforms. Anybody been paying attention to the election? And you have been paying attention to it if you live in America because it's everywhere, all right, because there's all kinds of, you know, uh, choose this guy and choose this girl and do this and do that. And, 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 and elections, uh, most elections are pretty normal. This one is not uh, normal at all. Very entertaining, actually. Um, and and it, it's become somewhat of a, of a showdown of an idea that we're, I'm going to call platforms this morning. Platforms um, is something that, that everybody has a platform. All the politicians have a platform. Everybody in this room has a platform. But a platform is this idea right here. A platform is something that you believe in or something, an idea. It could be an idea. It could be a theology. It could be a solution. It could be, you know, everything. And, and that's what all the candidates, they're all running on their platforms. They're, they're hoping, uh, they're, they're stepping up to lead um, with what they think, their platform, what they think is going to help our country and better our country or change our country or, or whatever it is that they're running on. Um, and, and if I were to start saying some names, you would know whether you agree or you disagree. You would know if, if I would say a name or if I would just say one of the platforms uh, like, build some walls, then you would know probably which one I'm talking about. I'm not going to mention any names or anything, but if I were just to, to say some platforms like socialism, that's a platform. I don't have to say any names. You probably know exactly you know, which one I'm talking about because they've run so hard on their platforms. And everybody has platforms. And, and, and this is the thing I want everybody to understand about platforms. For the record, if this is your first time here, I'm not talking about the election. I'm using this. This is called a sermon analogy. So don't freak out. I'm not about to tell you who to vote for. I'm just, you be an American and you vote for who you want to vote for. I'm not, never going to judge you for that. Don't judge me. So but this is the idea of a platform. Everybody has a platform. Everybody has a belief. Everybody has something uh, that they elevate in their life. They elevate. It could be ideologies and philosophies and theologies and, and everything. Something that is important to them that they just raise up. And we all have them. Everybody, everybody has platforms. But it's incredibly important that you understand what your platform is, especially when it comes to the church. Because platforms matter. Platforms matter in a huge way. They've always mattered. They have mattered more in your life. They've affected your life more than you would probably ever realize. Uh, you have been warped and changed and your thinking has been changed and altered and you've made life decisions based off of platforms in your life and based off other people promoting their platforms and convincing you that their platform is a good platform. And, and, and this is what I want to say. Everybody, you have to acknowledge me in this as we go through this. Everybody in this room, including myself and everybody in these chairs, you guys have platforms. And there's nothing wrong with having a platform. But when you have a platform, you are always tempted to elevate your platform up in competition with other people's platforms. Does that make sense? So platforms are not always bad things, right? Like a platform is like building a wall to solve a problem, or socialism to solve a problem, or a number one of the other stupid ideas that the politicians have these days in order to fix everything. I think that we need Jesus Christ. Uh, that's what I think that we need ultimately. But every, all these other little symptoms, that they all run on these platforms, and everybody has these platforms. All right, and you have a platform, and when you begin to raise your platform up, it ultimately will begin to change your perspective on things. It will ultimately begin to change your perspective. When you start to elevate your platform up, you will begin to see people differently. Right? Because if your platform in your life is raised up and that becomes super valuable, that belief or that idea or that thing becomes so valuable to you, and when you don't see it in other people, it does what? It changes your perspective of that person, doesn't it? Because just with me mentioning the idea of the wall, some of you were like, woohoo! And some of you were like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard, and you hate, you know, whoever that person is that, that likes the idea of the wall. That's why I'm using it for an example. 
an analogy. I'm not supporting anyone or anything, for the record. But when you elevate that platform up, it changes your perspective. There's people that have come into this church, this is no lie, have come into this church, have said to me out loud about the idea, and this is just a great example of a platform, the idea of Sunday school. Anybody grew up in the church and you went to Sunday school? I hated Sunday school, just for the record. We don't have Sunday school here. Nothing wrong with Sunday school. I think Sunday school is great if you like Sunday school, but we don't have Sunday school. We don't do Sunday school here. But for a lot of people who grew up with Sunday school, Sunday school is a big platform for them. And I've had people walk into this church and literally tell me, listen, you're a great preacher. I like you and everything, and the worship's fantastic, and all the people are nice, but are you ever going to have Sunday school? Nope, and they go on down the road. Why? Because that platform in their life was so elevated in their life that it changed their entire perspective of me and the church and worship. Because if we couldn't value what they value, it changed their perspective of who we are. That's how that works. Does that make sense? All right, so your platforms, whether you realize it or not, or you're conscious of it or not, your platforms change your perspective of people and things around you. And it also, the people looking into your platform, it changes your perspective of them. Because I didn't have a very good perspective of her when she left. Or that person Right? Because they're platforms, they get elevated. Another thing platforms do is it defines your focus. It defines your focus because these things become so elevated in your life. They become so elevated in your life that that's the thing that you begin to focus on. And everything else starts to take a peripheral, which is not a bad thing. Right? It's not always a bad thing to be super focused on something, but if you have a certain platform, whether it's a political platform or a, or a, a, theological, a theological platform or just a platform in school or whatever this idea is, and you begin to become so valuable and you elevate it up so high, you begin to focus on it and everything else becomes not as important as this. Because you're like, yeah, you have this, but yeah, you have this, and yeah, you have this, but you don't have this. And so if you focus on it and everything else becomes less valuable. And another thing that happens is everything, everything not, not, not just other things become less valuable, but people who don't value your platform become less valuable. Right? Think about it. You know it's true. Not for you, but for the pe- person next to you. You have a platform in your life that's elevated so high, and you're so focused on everything else gets in the peripheral, and other things become devalued, and eventually people will become devalued. Third thing is, is uh, platforms will always define your investments, right? It's always going to define your investments. You always invest in something that you value. And so a lot of times if your platform is so high, you know, there are people uh, that, that you, you will invest in the thing that agrees with your platform a lot of times. Right? I mean, that's how, that's how the whole political system works with donors. They try to get as many platforms as they can. And, and just we all know that politicians' platforms change from room to room, whoever they're, they're in. You know, and they come in, and this is my platform, and I believe in this, and this is what it is, and this is super important. And they always, they always come back to this platform, and then their hopes is that somebody will value the platform that they're standing on and will what? Give them money and invest in them. We, all, we will invest our time and invest our effort and invest our resources into platforms or into beliefs or into ideas, right, that we value. When we elevate platforms, it defines our investments. Does that make sense? And we all do this. You may not be aware of it, and you may not think about it, and you may not even realize that it's a bad thing, and it's not always a bad thing, but that's the truth. Every single one of us have platforms. We elevate platforms in our life, and it defines our perspective, it defines our focus, and it defines our investments. And it doesn't always have to be a problem, but this is when it becomes a problem. It becomes a problem when you walk inside of a church or you walk outside of a church And you have a platform in your life. Doesn't even have to be a bad platform, but you have a platform in your life that you have so elevated so high that the world and the unchurched and the unbelievers outside can't see the cross of Jesus Christ anymore because your platform is so high it's blocking it. Does that make sense? All right, now here's the, here's a portion. I know we're, we're doing the, the 15 in one thing, and it's an awesome thing, and so there's probably a lot of people in here. This is your first time here, and, and I love you, and I'm so glad you came, and I'm probably going to offend you in the next 15 minutes. And I still love you. Even if you go to a different church, you never come back. All right, but I want you guys to understand this. I want you guys to understand this. This is a huge thing. We all have platforms, and those platforms, and they're good platforms. I'm just going to use an example. Anybody grow up Baptist? You can you raise your hand. They're like, oh, they got, got me. It's fine. Nothing wrong with being a Baptist, if that's what you want to be. Nothing wrong with it. (laughs) Baptist, everybody know how the Baptist church started? A Baptist person would say, the grace of the Lord shined down on the land. (laughs) And the Baptist church was birthed. No, it was actually out of an argument about baptism. (laughs) 
You didn't see that one coming, did you? So the idea of baptism, they all had a church, and they believe in what they called the believer's baptism. And so this was different from that day and age. And everybody's like, is it 100 years old or 200 years old? It's actually like 400 years old, the original Baptist church. And there was this argument, and there was this thing, and there was this, they were going on about this. And so they're like, well, we're going to leave, and we're going to go over here, and we're going to do this because this is the way it happens. This is what baptism is all about. Nothing wrong with baptism. I believe in baptism. I was, I was baptized. I like baptism. I love ba- baptism. Baptism service is one of my favorite things in the world. Nothing wrong with baptism. It's a great platform to have. But the problem was is that you've elevated it so high. A lot of times you elevate it so high that you could no longer find unity with your fellow believers. And so it shifted over here. And then over 400 years, it split about 70, 100,000 other times. Right? The first Baptist, second Baptist, third Baptist, 14th Street Baptist, and 18th Street Baptist. And we believe, because, and listen, every church division that has ever existed on the face of the planet have come because of what? Because of platforms. Why? Because platforms always divide. Always. Platforms will always divide. They'll always divide you. And about 150 years ago around there, some people were praying. They had an experience uh, uh, with God, and, and, and they began to speak in tongues. Right? All the Baptist people just... They begin to speak in tongues, and, and, every, and nobody knew what to do with this idea of speaking in tongues, and so it became this movement, and, and everybody was going up, and what they began to do, and there's nothing wrong with speaking in tongues. Speaking in tongues is in the Bible. Read it sometimes. It's in there. You can't argue against speaking in tongues. Now, sometimes we're afraid of it, and we don't understand it. We've got to go. But this idea of speaking in tongues, it was just kind of a weird thing. It was kind of a spirit thing, and nobody really knew it. And here's the problem. is the, is the, Pente- is the Pentecostal church. Pentecostal churches, they had this idea of speaking in tongues. Nothing wrong with having a moment when you're speaking in tongues, because the Bible calls it a gift of the Spirit in the Bible. Nothing wrong with it. Here's the problem with the Pentecostal church. The Pentecostal church, they begin to say, okay, speaking in tongues is evidence of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is evidence of being saved. And so, actuality, if you follow through the right theology, if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. Right? So here's what it is. There's nothing wrong with saying you had an experience with God and, and, and that gift kind of came on you and you had a moment and, and you split. There's nothing wrong with that. It, it's not, that's very biblical. It exists in Scripture. But the moment that what? You take a platform and you elevate it up to around Jesus Christ, you're crossing some serious lines. You're going in the wrong direction. And every single denomination, every single church, if you go through the Catholic Church and the Presbyterian Church and the Episcopalian Church and the Baptist Church and the Pentecostal Church and the Church of God and the Church of Christ of Latter-day Saints, you go through all of those different, all of those different churches, everything, even the ones that have they've, they've gone so far, they've believed so much in their platforms that they've left Christianity behind altogether. Many of them have. That's what we call cults. And so we get these idea of platforms. And, and, and they're so divisive and they're so dividing that they've rolled in and we have everything and everybody. And now it's like, and here's the thing that happens. And this is always, nobody's ever like, I believe in Jesus so much, I'm going to start a church. They're like, I believe in speaking in tongues so much that I'm going to start a church. I believe in baptism like this so much that I'm going to start a church. I believe in this so much that I'm going to start a church. But nobody's like, I believe in Jesus, so I'm going to go start a church over here that just believes in Jesus. Otherwise, it would be called the church and not the Baptist church and the Methodist church and the Presbyterian church and the Calvinist church and the Armenian church and this church and that church. It would just be the church. So people ask me all the time, they're like, why aren't you connected to a a denomination? Is it because you don't like accountability? No, it's because I believe in the Bible. Right? Right? So if you grew up Baptist, nothing wrong with that. If you grew up Pentecostal, nothing wrong with that. You grew up Catholic, nothing wrong with that. I'm not slamming. I'm just trying to explain to you the damage that platforms have done to God's church. All right? But that's not even the biggest problem with platforms. The biggest problem with platforms, because it's not just all theological. Sometimes there's stances that people take. Is that most of the time, Most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, the unchurched, people who don't believe in Christ, people who resist God, people who resist the church, most of the time, people are resisting platforms far more than they're actually resisting Christ. That is the deadliest thing to the cross of Jesus Christ. And here's the part where I'm going to offend some people. Let's just take just a few that have just caused some, some major, just some major resistance to the church. Alcohol is a huge one. Alcohol is a huge one. Alcohol has been a part of every single culture since the dawn of man. All right? The Baptists say, don't drink alcohol at all. And the Catholics say, let's drink it every Sunday during church. <laughs> See, not everything's bad about the Catholic church. 
Right? But we take and we, we somewhere along the way, and it was probably for some great reasons. Somebody probably grew up in an alcoholic family. And there was something that, 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 that they went through as a child that just it shaped their idea of alcohol. And somewhere along the line, some way there was some, because nowhere in Scripture, nowhere in Scripture ever does it say that alcohol is not sin. In fact, the first miracle that Jesus ever made, he made like 20,000 gallons of wine. 20,000 gallons of wine. I mean, he would put your house parties to shame, 20,000 gallons of wine. All right? Nowhere does it say, but for years, all of a sudden, for years and years and years and years in, in modern contemporary Christianity, there was this huge stance, no alcohol. No alcohol. Been a part of every single culture since the dawn of man. It's a part of many genuine Christian. The way that they take communion is with wine, and all of a sudden people are outlawing out. You cannot have alcohol. Not a bad thing necessarily, but it became so elevated it became so lifted up that people began to resist the church, not Christ, not the cross, not God, but they began to resist this platform because when they looked inside of Scripture and they didn't see anywhere, anywhere did it ever say there was anything wrong with drinking or a sin with drinking, anywhere, nowhere. Is drunkenness a sin? Absolutely but nowhere it was. And so people started to look in, and this is what they started to see. They started looking to Scripture, and they were seeing things, and then they were seeing Christians with all these platforms that really weren't connected that much to the Bible. And so then they started to develop this entire attitude against the church. And they're like, well, I mean, it's this idea we couldn't play cards. You can't, here's another one. Here's, I'm going to make, oh, here we go. <laughs> Gambling is a sin. Oh, let's just let's do this. Show of hands. Nobody's done. No, there's no wrong answer except for there is. If you think gambling's a sin, I just, I just show hands if you have enough guts. Just to, you, you grew up, okay, we'll change it, we'll change it, we'll change it. You grew up hearing, not that you believe it, so that way no one's wrong. You grew up hearing that gambling was a sin. Just raise your hand. All those people are wrong. Ask them, why is that a sin? Here, here's something you don't know about me. Are you guys ready for this? So I spent some time in Ohio. I went, to, I went to one semester of this Bible school, and I eventually I left there, and I worked over there a little bit, and I went over there. Any guess on how Jordan paid for that first semester of Bible school? <laughs> Poker night. That's absolutely <laughs> daggum right. <laughs> Texas Hold'em is my game of choice. All right, but gambling's a sin. No, it's not. Somewhere along the line... This is, can, can gambling be a problem? Absolutely. All right? Can eating too much food, gaining weight, and crossing the line of obesity be a problem? Absolutely. That one will kill you faster than gambling will. All right? But what we do is, no, here's what we do. This is what the church does. Somebody has an idea. Somebody has a moment. Somebody has something, and it's not always a bad thing. A lot of times it comes from a good thing, and then it's because it hurt them, or they went, and they outlaw it, and it becomes this thing, and all of a sudden there's this platform that's created, and now it's not just the cross of Jesus Christ, but it's the cross of Jesus Christ and no alcohol, and the cross of Jesus Christ and no gambling, and the cross of Jesus Christ and no tattoos. I got one right here. It says, follower of God. It's Hebrew. Lemud Elohim can't really argue with that one. <laughs> right? But we get this thing and we've created this thing. And listen, here's the deal. I'm going to tell you something. And this is to the generation above me. And the generation right above them. This is my opinion as I look back through history and I've studied it. Those couple generations elevated so many platforms above Christ that in many ways they lost and cost the younger generation's relationship with him. You hear me? Nothing to be condemned about, nothing to be convicted about. But somewhere along the line, we, we went down this road of platforms and people began to resist the platforms they didn't really have a problem with Jesus. They didn't really have a problem with God. They didn't really have a problem with grace or a problem with faith. They just had a problem with your platforms. But what do you do when one of your platforms is very specifically in Scripture? What do you do with something like homosexuality? 
What do you do when there's something that, that, that we believe is in Scripture that's plain as day? No doubt about it. No doubt about it. I'm going to tell you something. If you elevate the things that you are against higher than the things that you are for, you are just as wrong as wrong could be. There is no, and I want you to hear me, there is no platform, period, that is more valuable than the person next to you. None. See, Christ died for the sinner, not the saint. And what we do, even with things that are genuinely in the Bible, we take those things and we are so staunch and we are so violent and we are so talkative and so verbal and so stern and so firm on the things that we're against. We've created this platform to where you have to change, then you can come to know Jesus. You got to do this, and then you can kind of come know Jesus. You got to think like this. You got to be a Republican. You got to be against abortion. You got to think economically like this. You can't be a homosexual. You can't do this. You can't struggle with this. And then when you can do all those things, then you can come to the cross of Jesus Christ. That's not Christianity, right? That's religion. That's man's bull crap is what that is, right? And we sit in here, and we wonder why there's doors closing left and right. It's not that they're resisting Christ. It's that they're resisting you. And they're resisting your platforms. And they're resisting your religion. And they're resisting your beliefs and your ideologies and your philosophies. Even the good ones. When they're elevated so high that they can't see the cross over your platform, you are in the wrong period. Period. And it's not like this just started. It's not like this just showed up in the last couple of generations. This was happening from the beginning. In fact, the whole reasons the Pharisees hated Jesus so much early on, it wasn't because of his view on himself, because he didn't even really tell them he was the son of God yet. It was because the Pharisees had a couple platforms that were so valuable to them, and Jesus didn't value the platforms that they valued, so they wanted to kill him long before he ever said he was the son of God. Jesus was in the, at, at a party, literally at a party. I don't know if he was drinking or not. I don't know. He made wine. Maybe he did. Maybe he didn't. I don't know. But he's sitting at the party with tax collectors and sinners and prostitutes. And the Pharisees came along and they condemned him from that moment on simply because he sat with them. Because their platform of holiness was that if you were holy and you were truly righteous, then you didn't even sit with sinners. And Jesus was like, I'm not going to hang out with you. Because of your righteousness. And he pulled them straight in the face and he says, I came for the sinners, not the saints. I came as a doctor to the ones who need healing, not to the ones who are perfect. Over and over and over and over again, the Pharisees battled him, not because he said he was the son of God. I could somewhat understand that. I could somewhat understand that. Someone walks in the room and says, I've been sent, I'm the son of God. I'm going to have some issues. He better start raising some people from the dead and doing some stuff if you're going to make that big of a statement. So I can understand. But that's not what the, that's not, they had problems with platform, they had platform problems with Jesus. So what was going on from the moment Jesus showed up? And they were trying to, they were trying to elevate the Jewish law above Jesus. And this was something that, that, that didn't start. And there's, there's, this goes through several examples all through the Gospels all through the New Testament, but there's one particular example I want to talk about today. It's in Galatians 5.1. And here's kind of the scenario. It was, it was Paul went and he planted a church in, the, in Galatia. And it was an awesome church, and it was a growing church, and they were on fire. And then here's what happened. Some of the people who put their faith in Christ, they started, they were so connected, and one of the platforms in their life was, was so Jewish that they couldn't quite let go of some of the Jewish laws and some of the Jewish customs for the complete freedom in Christ. And so what they started to do after Paul left is they started to come in and tell people, listen, it's, an, it's it, yeah, Jesus and faith in Jesus and Jesus Christ and the cross and the resurrection and all that, all that's good, all right, but you also, you're going to need this and you're going to need this and you're going to need this and you're going to need this. Just the same way we do it today. The same way that we do it today. 
But one of the things was circumcision. This became, this is the topic that, that, that Paul chose. Now here's the thing, all of your platforms, all the ones that, the ones that I offended and you, you were just about to leave a few minutes ago and you were like, I'll just wait and listen to this moron finish and then I'll leave and never come back. Like, you can replace circumcision with any platform that you have, good or bad. In the Bible, not in the Bible. doesn't matter. You replace it because he's picking this, but this is not the first time he does this or the last time he does this, but he continually throughout the New Testament has to continually say it's Christ and nothing else. In this particular situation, it's circumcision. So I just want to talk to this as we go. This is Galatians 5.1. It's going to be up here, and I just, I just want to read this. Starting off, 5.1. Paul says, It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. It's so powerful, this scripture, and I, and I want to explain this to you. So he's saying, listen, it's for freedom's sake that Christ set you free. Do you understand what that means? That means that you are a, a slave to what? To sin. You're a slave to sin. And he said he didn't set you free for sin's sake. He set you free so that you would be free. Sin was the thing keeping you not free, so he took care of sin so that you would be free. It wasn't had anything really to do with sin, and everything was making you free. Free to know God, free to be in relationship with him, and free to live the life that he's called you to live. Okay, does that make sense? It was freedom for freedom's sake. And then he goes and he says, so, so don't leave sin, the yoke of sin, the, the, the slavery of sin, simply to move yourself over and enslave yourself to something different. And again, it didn't say the yoke, like something specific. He said a yoke any yoke, anything that captures you, anything that holds you, any, anything, anything from the Old Testament, because that's what they're talking They're talking about things that were in the Old Testament. All right, this is biblical things. And he says, you cannot connect anything because if you connect anything, you lose your freedom in Christ. If you connect anything, you're simply going from the, uh, a slave of sin to a slave of religion or a slave of this or a slave of that. He said, he set you free for freedom's sake. And I just want you, you need to write, everybody in the room needs to write this down. If your view of Christianity is anything but absolute and pure freedom in Christ, you have a wrong view of Christianity, period. If there is anything in your life, if there's any platform in your life, if there's any belief system where it is the cross of Jesus Christ than anything else, that anything else will eventually enslave you and the people that you're around. It's just Christ and Christ alone. He goes on to say this. Mark my words, exclamation point. I, Paul, tell you that you let yourselves be circumcised. Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. So here's what I want you to understand. If you get into Christianity, you're painting this Christian thing to the world. I want you to understand this. If you step up and you say, yeah, it's Jesus and faith in Jesus and, and, and faith in the cross and faith in the resurrection and faith in what, what Christ has done, and it's also no alcohol, and it's also quit being gay, and it's also doing this, and it's also doing that. He says, listen, Christ is of absolutely zero value to you because Christ died for who? The sinners. Not for the ones that used to be homosexual and denounced homosexuality, and now they're ready for the cross. Nope. That's a Republican mindset. That's a conservative mindset. That's not a Christian mindset. Maybe it's a Baptist mindset. Maybe it's a Methodist mindset. Maybe it's a Catholic mindset. But it's not the mindset of Jesus Christ. All right? See, what we've done in the church, while I'm on the subject, what we've done in the church is we've taken this one particular sin and we've elevated it so high that most of the world hates us for it. And that sin is just as much a sin as your addiction to pornography. It's just as much a sin as your adultery. It's just as much a sin as you're sleeping around when you're not married. It's just as much a sin as you lying and stealing from your job. It's just as much a sin as you cheating on your taxes, all you do in taxes, and you're stealing from the government. It's just the same amount of sin. And Christ, Christ died for them the same way that he died for you. And the church needs to shut their mouth, promote Jesus Christ, and get out of the way. Or we're going to lose another generation because we've elevated this sin so high that it sickens the world around us. And I'm going to tell you something else. If you leave because of that, good riddance. Hmm. Mm. 
Galatians 5.4, he says, You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. He says, listen, I want you to understand this. When you, when you, when you, add, when you start adding stuff, you start adding a little bit of hatred. You start adding a little bit of racism. You start adding a little bit of this and a little bit of that. You start adding all this junk to it, and, and, and you got to believe like this and think like this and do like this and dress like this and talk like this, and you got to do all that. He said, you've left Christianity. You've left Christ. You've left the church that Christ said that he was going to build, and you've left grace. See, grace is a gift. Do you know what a gift is? That means it comes absolutely 100% free. So you don't have to change anything. You don't have to do anything. You just come to Christ the way you are. If I were to give you a play-by-play, a minute-by-minute of my activity to-do list on the Saturday night before the Sunday morning that I gave my life to Christ, you'd fire me. If you name it, I was probably doing it. And I walked into the building covered with all of that sin. Hung over, I might add. And Christ saved me in that moment. Just as dirty as I ever was. Why? Because he came for the sinner, not the saint. And when you, you lose the focus of that, just for a minute, you become legalistic. And you lose the thing that separates us from the rest of the world, and that is grace. There's no other religion, there's no other belief system, and there never has been in the history of the world to have their entire foundation of their belief be on the idea of grace, on the idea that you have to do nothing. You deserve it in no way, and you have to do nothing to receive it. There's never been one. There will never be another one because it, def- it just goes against every ounce of human nature because we, we want to earn it and we want to think we deserve it. None of us deserve the cross of Christ. None of us deserve Christ to die on that wood. None of us did. And we did nothing to get it. We did nothing to change it. We didn't prepare ourselves. We didn't get holy enough. There was nothing. It was Christ said, I save you because I love you. And that's it. And we accept that grace, and then we put a whole bunch of walls around it when we try to stuff it down the world's throats. He says, when you do this, you lose grace. For through the Spirit, this is 5 through 6, for through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. And I want you to read this. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. The only thing that counts, the only thing that matters is your faith in Jesus Christ expressing itself through love. Nothing else. Nothing else, Taylor Columbia. Nothing else. That's it. Not a political system, not a theological system, not Calvinism, not Arminianism, not how you get saved, not any of that, none of it. All the biblical stuff, none of it. The only thing that counts is your faith in Christ expressing itself to this world through love. That's the only thing that counts. Yeah, but it's the only thing that counts. Well, can I get a second opinion? No, this is God's opinion. Well, can we have a discussion about it? Absolutely not. The only thing that counts is your faith being expressed through love. Not anything else. See, there is a a dark, dark world out there, and they are hungry. Mark my words. They are hungry for life. They are hungry for light. They are hungry for the love of God, and they may not even know it. And they're walking around this world and they're looking for it. They're looking for that reason to live. They're looking for that purpose. They're looking for that abundant life and they don't even know it. They're looking for the love of Jesus Christ. They're looking for it and they can't see it because you're blocking it with your stupidity. 
because you're blocking it with your conservative views, because you're blocking it with your theological ideas, because you're blocking it with your philosophy. You're blocking the cross of Jesus Christ with all of your platforms. And I believe every person in this room will bow down before Christ and he will ask, why did you hide the cross? with all of these things that don't matter because the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. He goes on to say in a few more scriptures down, he says, a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I'm confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. So there's a lot of you right now, I'm telling you, you're mad at me. And you're right now trying to do some research to prove wrong some of the things I'm saying. And Paul says, and I love this, Paul says, listen, a little bit of yeast, a little bit of stupidity is going to ruin the whole thing. A little bit of Christ and is going to ruin the whole thing. Just a little bit of a platform is going to ruin the whole thing. And he says, and I'm confident if you're really in Christ, you'll have the same view. And why can he say that? Because that is the view of Christ. That's the view of Christ. He says, so if you're walking with the same Christ I'm walking with, and if you're reading the same Gospels I'm reading, and you're studying the same life of Jesus that I'm studying, I'm confident that you'll walk away with the same view. And you know how he ends this whole, this, this whole thing? And I, I think this is crazy. I'm not going to get into the details of what circumcision is. Hopefully we all are kind of aware of it. If not, later, when you're all by yourself, Google it. Be careful. But Google it. Because this last sentence, and I don't want you to understand this. this. This isn't like he's having a, he's yelling. At the top of his lungs, he's yelling. And if you didn't think that, if you weren't sure, I just love the way he, 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 he says, and I'm just going to read off here. As for those agitators, those ones that are adding, I wish they would go the whole way and just emasculate themselves. If you don't know what that is, you need to Google that. Again, be very careful. It means go ahead and just cut the whole thing off. Right. He says, listen, that's his view. That's his view of the ones that add to Christ. I didn't say this, but that's his view. And that needs to be your view too. That needs to be your view too. And if there's anything else in your life, you need to cut the whole thing off. Christ and Christ alone. Christ came and died. For every single human being's sins, to set them free to have a relationship with the God of the universe. There should never be any other idea, any other philosophy, any other theology, anything that gets in the way of the world knowing that reality. And if there's anything else that gets in the way, of the world knowing that reality, then we're wrong. It's not our job to change the world. It's not our job to change the sinner. It's our job to introduce them to Jesus Christ. Then Christ changes the sinner. It's not our job to go in and, and fix people and prepare them to know Jesus. The Bible says it is a sin for the church to judge or condemn the sinners of this world because that's his job, not our job. It says for the church to judge each other, and that's basically what I'm doing this morning. I'm stepping up as my role as pastor of this church, and I'm bringing down some judgment on the church for not representing Christ the way that we should. You will never see me judge someone who's not a Christian because it is a sin for me to do that. That is Christ's job, not mine. When it comes to the one that doesn't know Christ, it is my job to walk over to them, to love them, to hug them, and to shine the light of Jesus Christ in their life, and that is it. I was condemned about a year ago by two other pastors in the area. They will always remain nameless because I had befriended someone who has become a great friend of mine who was very much a sinner, condemned publicly for my friendship with this 
person. Within a year of hanging out with this person, they gave their life to Christ and were baptized. That should be all of our stories. That we hung out with the sinners. And they saw something in our life that was different than what they see in the world. And they wanted the thing so that they come and follow after Christ. There was plenty of sin going on. It's not my job to judge it. Not my job to call it out. Hear me. It's not the church's job to call out the sin of the world. They're sinners. That's what they do. The same way that you used to do it. The same way many of you still do it, you hypocrites. It's not our job. It's our job to shine the light of Jesus Christ and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and let Jesus Christ and the Spirit of the living God change them. It's our job to love them. If you guys will stand with me.